Okay. Uh, well, why don't we make a start? Let me start with a very warm welcome uh, to our presenter today, Michael, but also to everyone for joining us. As I look at it, I think we've got at the moment just over 150 people who've joined us. It's a very exciting new initiative for us at CSAE. This is the inaugural uh, CSA external webinar. It also marks the end of our uh, do-it-yourself CSAE conference, which we've been running online. And I want to thank uh, everyone at CSAE and everyone in that conference. We really appreciate it. Before I introduce Michael, can I just uh, give a couple of instructions as to the way we'd like to do this? We've got people who are joining us as panelists, and then we've got people who are joining us as attendees. Um, if you're a panelist, can I uh, start by asking you please to go on mute? Um, I'd also like, if possible, for the panelists to turn their videos on. This is our best attempt uh, to try to imitate a real-world seminar to the extent possible. If you're a panelist and you have a question for Michael, um, I need you to use the raise your hand uh, functionality that you'll find in Zoom. Now, for other attendees, uh, if you've got a question for Michael, then please type it, even just a brief summary of the question, into the Q&A functionality that you will see. Um, obviously, we've got a lot of people and not a lot of time. Um, so I won't be able to call everyone, but I'm going to try to summarize questions uh, whenever Michael would like to, to take them. Michael's going to speak today for about 45 minutes. We'll have some questions throughout, as and when suits Michael. And then we're going to try to have about 15 minutes of questions and discussion uh, at the end. We are also live streaming on YouTube. This means that if you uh, speak or if you uh, turn your video on, then you might also be uh, viewable on YouTube as well. With all of that said, I'm thrilled to be able to welcome Michael to this inaugural webinar. Michael really needs no introduction, but I'll give him a brief one anyway. Uh, he's the Gates Professor of Developing Societies uh, in the Department of Economics at Harvard University and the joint winner of the 2019 Nobel Prize in Economics. And we're absolutely thrilled, Michael, to have you present first today. Great. Thank you so much, Simon. Uh, uh, it's wonderful to be here. I, I wish I'd been able to be at the CSAE conference in person, but uh, I guess this will be the, the substitute. Um, before starting, let me, uh, let me do the traditional uh, uh, thanking and acknowledging of my co-authors, but I'll, I'll add to that a little bit. Um, so in particular, I'd like to recognize uh, Sasha Gallant in Evidence Action, Olga Rostov-Shova at the University of Chicago, and, and Milan Thomas at Georgetown. Um, but I also wanted to thank uh, Esther Duflo, who uh, was involved in, in some earlier analysis that, uh, that, that informed this. And I also wanted to add a disclosure. This paper is going to draw on data from USAID's Development Innovation Ventures Program. And I'm involved in that program. I'm scientific director of that program, helped, helped co-found it, and, um, and uh, various other people involved in, the, in, the, in writing this were, were involved in that. In fact, this program started out as a, this paper started it was sort of veering off in an academic direction, but it, it started out as a, uh, as a government report. And in some ways, it's, it's sort of uh, halfway between the two. So, I hope it will be of, uh, of interest to people. So our paper is about innovation, and you know, innovation is something that a lot of governments are interested in, uh, a lot of funders are interested in this. Um, and you know, one of the reasons for that is that innovation is, is widely seen as the key driver of long-run economic growth. Um, and to give you think about innovation in a broad sense, encompassing not just new technologies, but also new business models and policies. Um, and there's reason to think that there's market failures around uh, innovation. Um, and not only market failures, but also think of innovation as a global public good, at least to the extent it could be supplied. Um, it could, have, could influence many countries and, and most innovations could potentially be adopted in many countries. There might also be reason to think that uh, different sets of countries might have, there's some technological needs that are, are worldwide, but there are other technological needs that uh, might be specific to particular regions or sp specific to low income countries. And I'll come back to that. So um, there've been a lot of initiatives recently in the past uh, couple of decades to promote innovation and in international development. And broadly, three categories. First, there's efforts to fund scientific uh, research and development. So the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been very active in promoting health research on 
and often health research on the specific health challenges of developing countries or grand challenges uh, programs where CGIAR uh, has been for a very long time uh, promoting research on the agricultural challenges that, that are uh, specific to developing countries. Um, so, and second category would be social science research. Um, and there are you know, many uh, funders of that. That would include uh, you know, the World Bank has been supportive of that. Um, uh, and that includes a lot of work with, the, um, with RCTs or with the experimental method, but you know, other, perhaps other work as well. Um, and the third category, and, and that's something that you know, probably has really taken off um, in the past you know, couple of, of decades, um, the, um, the, at least the experimental uh, um, work that's sort of oriented towards innovation specifically as opposed to general understanding of, of development. Um, a third category is impact investing and social entrepreneurship. So sorts of things, the Midyear Network or the School Foundation uh, would support, or you know, there's also been a lot of the World Bank's development marketplace has supported a lot of this. So this is a, a very uh, popular, you know, it's, it's been a popular activity, but I think there's a legitimate question whether this is a good investment. Um, you know, you can certainly, um, you, you have, I think it's important to think about whether the return on this exceeds the return on other development investments. So we could be building roads, we could be investing in human capital. You know, is this where we should be putting our, our resources? And you know, if you look at the websites of these organizations, they have lots of stories of promising uh, investments. They have some stories, although maybe not as many as you would like, of, uh, of, of actual successes. But there are also many, many cases of failure. And you know, there's a literature, the literature on this, there is a literature on this, but I think from a, certainly from an academic point of view, it leaves something to be desired. Um, you know, there's a lot of literature that's just straight anecdotes. There's some literature on counts, how many projects were successful, how many were, were you know, by some metric, how many were, were failures. Often those are you know, pretty sobering. Uh, there aren't that many successes. Um, but as I'll argue later, I think there's some, just looking at the raw counts may be, um, may be misleading. Now, one area where I think there is probably the most developed academic literature is looking at the returns to scientific research and development. And there's a, been a tradition of looking at that question, it certainly goes back to Grillica's uh, work on hybrid corn in the US, if not, if not earlier. And that, that literature typically finds very high rates of return. A 60, 70% return, rates of return are not uncommon, suggesting that this you know, really, that scientific R&D uh, may be a very good investment. Um, so I should emphasize that's the social rate of return. Um, there's sometimes that the also calculate um, if they break it down into publicly funded R and D and, and uh, private R and D. But either way, they get very high rates of return. Okay. So what this paper is going to do is it's going to focus to some extent on a it's going to it's going to look at a program that didn't support much sort of pure bench science scientific R and D but it's gonna look at investment and innovation for development. And it's gonna focus on social science RCTs and social entrepreneurship efforts. And I hope the methodology will be um, useful for other uh, portfolios. Um, the, the basic you know, part of what we'll be doing is developing a bounding approach to address this question. So it's a hard thing to do, but I think the bounding approach makes it a bit easier. And we'll apply that to the portfolio of development innovation ventures, this USA program. So the, the, so the just to go back. So the first question we'll try to address is, is development innovation a good investment? The second question will be um, trying to understand which innovation scale. And if you could try to understand this, that might be, might be useful in thinking about um, which innovations to fund, might be useful in in thinking about how to design um, efforts to invest in innovation. Why look at scale? Well, scale is a necessary but not sufficient condition for social impact. Um, if you, um, a lot of 
a lot of investments in innovation, uh, the innovation just doesn't, you know, there may be some initial piloting or a little bit of effort beyond that, but it doesn't reach you know, more than a few hundred or a few thousand people. Um, and it, it doesn't seem to go anywhere. And it's typically, um, you won't be able to get high social returns uh, from those. So now you could have something that scales up, but doesn't produce much social impact. And then, so that's why I say it's a necessary but not sufficient condition. Um, however, it's possible to get, it's much easier to get data on scale than on the overall social returns, which I think is what we would ideally look at. Um, there's also a, a, a widespread concern over the extent to which impact investing and social entrepreneurship uh, efforts have led to scaling, uh, particularly efforts to serve the poor. So obviously there are a lot of commercially developed innovations that have scaled in the, in, around the world, including the developing world. Think about uh, mobile phones, um, or uh, that would be, you know, uh, that, there are many other examples, but that's a very dramatic example. That was developed not from a impact investing motive or by a social entrepreneur, that was developed by a particular firm that, that were commercially motivated, but then this wound up having a, you know, really dramatic impacts on the poor as well. But if you look at the subset of innovations that, um, that are oriented towards, um, that were designed specifically to serve the poor and that were funded by impact investors and, and uh, where the innovators were uh, organizations that see themselves as part of the social entrepreneurship movement, there's, you know, there are some successes, uh, very important ones, but there's a lot of concern over, over the relative scarcity of those. Um, and you know, that was really one of the motivations for why we wanted to undertake this, this analysis. There's an existing talk of which innovation scale. I think that, you know, that, that, that is an interesting literature, but I think it leaves some things to be uh, desired. Um, often that's based on a subjective ex post innovation of the innovations which scaled. So I can break this into the literature and the sort of private sector and public sector tend to be quite separate. So the, the private sector ones, um, they will typically say, okay, here are some innovations coming from social entrepreneurship or impact investing which scaled, what do they have in common? Um, one issue with this is it's often ex post analysis. So they might, they often stress issues, stress factors, which are similar to those in the venture capital literature, the important, you know, having a good management team or being flexible and responding to customer needs. The problem is ex post, if they succeeded, you're likely to say, well, they had a good management team and they were responsive to customer needs. But ideally you would like um, an ex ante analysis and you would like to look at the full set of, of innovations that were funded and then say, you know, which ones of those scale based on things that were observable ex ante, if that's gonna be useful as a guide for, for policy. And on the public sector side, uh, I, I think there's you know, similarly very strong beliefs based on, um, I would argue, inadequate evidence. And you know, there you get beliefs that it's important to governments have to be involved from the beginning, they should have some skin in the game, they should have funded things, on that, uh, you know, there are a set of other things that you know, I think very much influence the, the, uh, influence the, um, the approach that organizations like the World Bank or, or DFID often uh, take towards funding decisions. So we're gonna try to do a predictive analysis of innovation scaling rate based on observable characteristics at the time of the award. So you know, I don't wanna claim, you know, we've got a tiny number of data points here. Um, this is, uh, we're not gonna have you know, causal analysis. This is a very applied policy research paper. But, um, and um, I guess I look forward to hearing the methodological complaints of which there, you know, there'll be many uh, justified ones, I'm sure. But um, the, you know, we're trying to move the literature at least a half step forward in terms of rigor. Um, so the, just to give you a preview of where I'm going, I'll give you a background on development innovation ventures. That's the uh, funding mechanism um, that produced the portfolio of innovations, which we're going to examine uh, for the analysis. 
Um, then I'll go through the methodology for uh, assessing the portfolio return, or perhaps I should say, but better say, um, addressing this question of is innovation investment, is innovation a good investment? Um, and then I'll go through the application to development innovation ventures for that question. Then I'll go through some of the correlations of uh, the correlates of which innovation scale. And then you know, we'll conclude and offer a hypothesis for uh, maybe model might be a bit grandiose, but, but why not? Um, uh, so a, a model or a sketch of a model of what might help explain some of these results in, um, uh, in, in both sections of the talk. Um, Simon, do you want, maybe before I jump in, are there any questions that- Thanks, that... Michael. I, I, I haven't seen anyone. Uh, if someone has a question that they want to throw up their hand. Um, so one question um, from David Barnard, are you going to be able to compare the return to investing in development to another field such as climate change? Uh, I couldn't hear you. My connect oh, internet sorry. connection isn't fantastic. Could sorry. you repeat that? Uh, sure, a question from David Bernard. Are you going uh -huh. to be able to compare the return to investing in development to another field such as climate change? Okay, so I I I, uh, I heard about climate change. I don't think this is a great question. I don't think we, we have not yet done an analysis comparing which sectors are most fruitful. Um, I suspect that we cannot that we wouldn't be able to do that with our analysis um, for reasons that you'll see. But that it potentially could be. Could, <laughs> so I think you. Potentially, you, yeah, I don't think this type of analysis, unfortunately, will be useful for that. I hate to be uh, be uh, disappointing on that, but I, I don't think um, I don't think these techniques will be useful for that. Um, the reason is it's going to. I think we will be able to answer some important questions, but this is based on a bounding exercise, and um, and that's going to make it very difficult to compare returns across sectors. Um, the thank um, you. What we to say is that returns are strongly positive in multiple sectors, but I don't I don't know whether we can do, we, I don't think we'd be able to do something positive, uh, sorry, comparative. Um, and um, at this point, I can't, um, I couldn't even address this in multiple sectors. We just don't have enough data. Okay. But I hope Thanks. this will be useful in, in, to others who, who maybe do want to look at other portfolios or, or other sectors uh, or specific sectors. Okay, I hope the methodology will. Okay, so let me give some, some background on the particular uh, portfolio that we're looking at. So this is a, a unit within USAID called Development Innovation Ventures. Because, so one of the lessons from the literature on innovation is that innovations often take a long time to scale, decades to scale. Um, so we're gonna focus on the early portfolio of Development Innovation Ventures. Uh, it started about 10 years ago in 2010, which is one of the reasons why we took a look at it now. Um, and we're looking, we'll just be looking at the first two and a quarter years, basically, two, 2010 through 2012. So only 17 million spent then. Um, it was a very, you know, um, really a shoestring effort at that point. Um, and I'll talk, just to give background, I'll say a little bit about the original structure and processes of development innovation ventures, which you know, differ from the current ones, but also differ from a lot of other innovation funders. So first, we were open funding to support innovation across a wide range of sectors. Um, um, so you know, we were so you know, we weren't limited to climate or health. We weren't limited to a particular geography. We weren't limited to. We also, unlike a lot of uh, efforts, we were open both to things that would scale commercially or were intended to scale commercially. Um, so, for example. Um, uh, cook stoves um, um, or, and to things that were you know, public policy innovations that would scale through adoption by, by governments. Um, we had a very broad definition of innovation as well, including both you know, gadgets and tech, but also things that were um, behavioral insights that could be applied to uh, public policy programs, for example. So while we were open, there, 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 there needs to be some way to select. And we had a quite rules-based uh, approach um, with and a tiered funding approach. So we had relatively small grants for piloting. Those at the time that was under $100,000. We had 
up to stage two was up to a million dollars for rigorous testing um, for something that was supposed to scale through the public sector that was rigorous evidence of causal impact and of cost effectiveness that didn't have to be and doesn't have to be an, uh, an RCT, but in practice, most of the applications were RCTs. You know, we'd be open to a regression discontinuity design, et cetera. Um, for things that were supposed to scale commercially, um, we were looking for a test that this was actually going to be uh, uh, you know, viable in the market. And then stage three was for transitioning the most successful uh, uh, approaches to uh, to scale, but they had to have gone through the equivalent of, of stage two testing. Things could come in at any stage. You don't have, don't have to go through stage two um, at DIB to go on to stage three, but you should have met the, the, the requirements of, um, from the previous stage. Uh, the, the selection and investment process um, were pretty different than what it, you see in a lot of the venture capital world are what's often thought of as, as best practice. Um, we had pretty strict procurement rules um, that governed us because we were part of the government and with small staff. So there's very little ability to go solicit proposals or to co-create proposals. Um, and a lot of, at least during that 2010 through 12 period, um, you know, one of the many venture capital funders see themselves as not just providing money, but adding value through technical support and advice, through linkages uh, to other parts of the uh, innovation ecosystem. Um, there was not that much of that uh, DIV during that time. It's basically providing money. Um, the, the selection process was you know, not based, many venture capital firms, there'll be an investment memo process um, where the staff are you know, highly skilled, um, um, and write an investment memo. Here, there was you know, really peer, a lot of peer review based on the application, send it out to the external reviewers. Um, often those were development economics researchers. Sometimes those were uh, venture capitalists or, or other investors. Just, there was definitely staff input, but there wasn't you know, skin in the game in the way that um, um, somebody in a, in a venture capital firm uh, would have it. Um, we did try to make some potential assessment of potential for scale, but it, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't necessarily putting the emphasis on a lot of the factors that the existing uh, literature emphasizes. We did put a lot of emphasis on cost. We're looking for things that were inexpensive uh, and the belief that things that were expensive were unlikely to scale. Um, we were pretty flexible on the team composition. We didn't, we weren't, you know, I, I think a lot of venture capitalists, they want an, uh, a team that has, that they think can, can has the you know, requisite management skills. You know, we were happy to fund graduate students and so on. Um, the, a lot of funders who are funding um, things that are designed to scale through the public sector, for example, I, I think I remember 3IE, uh, but many funders, uh, they want to serve an implementer and they want to show the implementer is really committed to it and then they want a very separate evaluator who's uh, who's not not the implementer um and we we didn't really we were happy to fund both the evaluation and the implementation we're happy for those to the same team to be involved in both let me give you a sort of more concrete sense of what some of the innovations we supported were um so I'll just pick out a few. So we, we had 40, the, during this period, there were 43 awards to 41 innovations. I'm gonna show you the full list. You know, the analysis is based on that full list. Um, so there were some things that were very much of the sort that social entrepreneurs could do. This is a, a, a program, uh, a, a for-profit firm um, done by graduates of MIT's um, business school. Um, they were trying to, um, trying to start a sanitation business in Kenya. Um, this, here's a, this is you know, much more social science approach, um, a election monitoring approach that was, this was, I was referring to something that was started by uh, graduate students, maybe it's graduate students in a postdoc. Uh, these were people that, um, uh, at University of California, San Diego proposed this, um, this um, uh, 
uh, idea for election monitoring and we supported that. So that was a social science RCT. Um, okay. um, here is a nonprofit firm with a, with a, I believe if I'm remembering this right, this was sort of a, a bicycle uh, innovation, uh, sort of bicycle hire innovation um, that they were trying to do. So social entrepreneurship by, for, by a nonprofit. Um, this is one that was, um, actually it was an academic who proposed this, but they were, were trying to do psychometric credit assessment and then solve it, sort of make that into a, a business. Um, okay. um, I'll talk about this one later. This, is a, uh, this was also pro uh, proposed by academics. Um, I'll, I'll explain it later, so I won't go into it now. Okay. Um, yeah, that's another one I'll talk about later. Um, okay. So, um, what was the um, methodology that, so that gives you a sense of the things we funded. Now let me switch over to discussing uh, uh, the benefit, you know, our approach for answering this question of whether the discounted benefits of an innovation investment are greater than the cost. And the basic idea is to get at the benefit cost ratio and see if that benefit cost ratio is greater than one. So the benefits are the number of people reached times the net benefits per person. Um, when we quantify the benefits, because we're gonna uh, compare them to the investment by DIV, we're only gonna include the share of the benefits corresponding to the share of the innovation investment. Um, the idea of this is to sort of avoid double counting. You know, A lot of funders are happy to list the things they funded that were successful, but they don't necessarily mention that there was a bunch of other co-funding. So um, we're gonna try to you know, address that. Now, one advantage of this is it allows aggregation. If the whole sector did this, and we added up the benefits overall um, and compared them to the cost, we, we'd be getting the return to the innovation investment overall. Um, that said, I don't wanna claim that this gets at the counterfactual. We're, not, we're just not able to answer the question. Suppose we hadn't funded them, others had, or if we hadn't, and would they still have been able to, to do what they did? Um, you know, I, I can give you my subjective impression, but you know, I, I won't be able to give you a, um, a, a scientific answer to that. Um, it, the, um, it is, even with this sort of quite limited aim, it's very difficult to estimate the benefits for many innovations. And that's you know, for a number of reasons. First, there could be conceptual difficulties. Um, so some, for example, if you think about innovations to reduce electoral fraud, um, the, um, how are you gonna put a dollar value on that? Even if it's, you can show that there's a reduction in election fraud, you know, how do you put a dollar value on it? What are the, uh, a second issue is that even in, where you could conceptually value something, often the data is just not there. There's not often, even for development and innovation ventures, there might not be a credible impact on the form of the innovation which scaled. Because the one thing we were very clear with our innovators about was that um, we understand that the innovation is going to change over time and be adapted. And that moving from something that state, what we would call stage two, a rigorous uh, evidence on impact and cost effectiveness to stage three, uh, where this is scaled up, there's almost certainly going to be uh, adjustments to the way the, the program is put in place. And uh, it may not be possible to, to, um, to generalize the results. And the third reason, which I've alluded to earlier, is that innovations often take time to scale. So a lot of the benefits, are, one would hope, would be in the future, but obviously we don't know about that. So that, that's just going to make it very hard to get the total benefits. Um, we can get, have some sense of the total cost because we know how much we spent, but how are we going to get at the, the benefits? So the approach that we took was to not try to quantify the benefit cost ratio, but rather it was a bounding approach. And the idea was we were gonna take advantage of the skewed distribution of innovation returns. So I'll show you in a minute with our data, a very skewed distribution of innovation reach. And I think it's safe to say that the distribution of returns is very skewed as well. And that means that if you, you can just look at a subset of innovations, and you can compare the benefits of that subset of innovations to the cost of the full portfolio. Um, so you know, in particular, we're gonna take four innovations 
where we think we can get you know, some sense of the benefits. And we're gonna compare that to the cost of the whole portfolio of 43 awards to 41 innovations. And now we'll get a lower bound on the benefit cost ratio for the portfolio as a whole. And if that lower bound is greater than one, then, um, then you can say this was a, a good investment. Obviously the discount rate is gonna be important, but we, we'll, we'll set that. We'll, in a lot of areas, we're gonna to try to be conservative. So we set the discount rate as 10%, thinking that the typical development investment you know, probably doesn't have a return that's, that's higher than that. Um, um, and Michael, uh, yeah. Michael, just to jump in and say about, yeah. about, 15 more, about 15 minutes more, if that's okay with you, and then we'll move to questions. Okay, maybe I'll try to see if I can, can speed up a bit. Um, so for many of the development innovation investments that we supported are health related, we'll value those at national GDP per capita. Uh, we'll figure the cost is 19 million, the, the uh, plus some, some estimate of portfolio costs. I told you that the distribution of returns was very skewed. So if you look at the 41 innovations, this shows the number of people reached. And you'll see that, um, that these that if, you know, the, the vast majority of benefits are going to be accounted for by um, the, the, the top innovations, which reached more than a million people here. Um, let me give you some sense of what those were. I'll try and go through quickly. The four ones in red are the ones where we're going to quantify the benefits. And I'll give you some sense of how we do that. So the top three are not going to enter into calculation of benefits at all, but I'll just give you a sense I'm going to, uh, of what they were. And um, I'll, I'll, get, I'll say a little bit about them. First one was software for community health workers. Um, this reached 20 million people by the end of 2018. That's when our analysis ends. Um, it's in a number of countries, including India. There are, there are a number of RCTs. One suggested increased uh, rate of delivery in facilities by 17%. Uh, uh, election um, uh, innovation voter report cards. Uh, it's reached 10 million people in an adapted form, not in the original form that was done in the RCT. That reduced vote buying by 20%. Um, election monitoring approach in Afghanistan reduced theft of election materials by 60%. That was later used in the, um, um, in the um, adopted by the um, Ashraf Ghani campaign, uh, again, in an adapted form. But how do you put a dollar value on those things? We don't include any, any of those. Here's three that we do include. I'll come back to these later and go a little bit detail. The second one we also uh, I'll go back to. Um, psychometric credit assessment I, I mentioned earlier. Um, that's um, scaled up considerably. 1.5 billion in loans has been made. Um, uh, went to 1.5 million customers using this approach, but um, we don't know how to put a dollar value on it. And then a mobile agricultural extension, um, which I, I should say some of these, I was involved in the early uh, development of that one. Um, so I want to disclose that. Um, okay. So let me give you an example of how we do the, uh, the calculate the benefits. So this is a, an innovation that was um, developed by uh, James Habirimana and Billy Jack at Georgetown University. So James and Billy had the idea, which I have to admit, you know, sounds like a little bit of a crazy idea, which is that, um, as, as I'm sure everybody here knows, there's a lot of traffic accidents due, um, with minibuses in, in much of the developing world, and certainly in Kenya, where they're known as matatos. And um, their idea was that the passengers would like the drivers to slow down, but they, do, they feel awkward speaking up. And that didn't seem strange to me. That, that's certainly my experience. Um, but that they, that if you put up a sticker inside the minibus, the passengers would feel empowered to speak up and the drivers would respond. That, that's the part that seemed um, optimistic, to put it mildly. But they actually did a RC, small RCT on their own. Um, they found some very encouraging results. It had some problems. But they approached DIV and said, you know, we'd like to do another RCT where we'll be larger sample, address some of the issues in the original RCT. Uh, we funded them to do that. We got data from the insurance company and found that road accidents fell by 25%. Um, they have a paper on this in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, so you know, very prestigious journal. And this was scaled to 40,000 minibuses through a combination of the private sector and public sector. The largest insurance company in Kenya 
adopted this. Presumably, it's in their interest to reduce traffic accidents. And the government for keep it in 30% of the innovation investment. If we do make some assumptions on the value of a dollar that I think are fairly conservative, um, 15 million in benefits are so far. Obviously, this will grow over time. And that's 5 million uh, for, for as, as sort of assigned to DIB. Here's a chlorine dispensers. Uh, this was another one that took place in, in Africa and East Africa. Um, there, this, this provided a water treatment solution. Um, this one's estimated to generate you know, 60 million in net benefits, 5 million costs to, to you know, sort of very high return. If you add these up, I won't go through all four, but if you add these up for, for, the, for four in a projects where we can quantify the benefits, um, we get, and just taking the benefits through 2018, the benefits of those four divided by the cost of the full portfolio, so not the cost of those four projects, but the cost of the full portfolio, 40, uh, 43 awards, you get a five to one uh, benefit cost ratio. That corresponds to about a 75% uh, rate of return. And so, you know, very, very high, but also, and this is a lower bound, um, but also not out of the ballpark for the for the what we get for other forms of scientific, other forms of innovation investment, in particular the scientific R&D. Now, if you're willing to project this out, assuming that the the uh, programs continue at their current levels, uh, you get a ninefold uh, benefit cost ratio by 2023. And of course, this excludes all of the innovations that reach less than a million people, five of the nine innovations with the highest reach, um, and um, and some externality benefits. Yeah, that's the that's so you know, the first question we set out to answer is is development innovation a good investment um you know it looks here like like it is a good investment um at least from you know this one program uh over this in the, in the initial period second thing uh, issue we tried to address was the correlates of scaling so for that we categorized the awards based on ex ante data the 41 data points so not a huge sample and then I'm going to start with univariate analysis, and then I'll do lasso. So the first hypothesis is that pilots never scale. So we tried to look at, um, by stage. And what we found was in the, the one stage three investment scaled, so that's 100%, but not a whole lot of data, 25% rate of scaling at stage twos, and for the pilots, a 17% rate of scaling. So it looks like we're confirming the conventional wisdom there. In fact, however, you take the analysis, if you're, and you, you say, how many people are reached per dollar spent, you get a very different picture. In fact, stage ones, you know, the point estimate, it looks like you reach the most people per dollar spent. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, make a big deal of that. There's not a lot of data here. But it certainly doesn't, there's no evidence uh, whatsoever that, um, that investing in, you know, taking a lot of, investing in pilots is a bad idea. If you took a count approach or a ratio approach, you would say that. But if you look at the uh, benefit, the number of people reached per dollar spent, you wouldn't. I think there was some very interesting finding about business models, ones that I you know, might not have guessed. So a lot of innovators were planning to sell direct to consumers. I, I didn't, um, unfortunately, this didn't come. Out, what didn't uh, show the all, didn't have time to go through all of the things we funded in detail. You know, we funded a lot of solar energy things, for example, which had a direct to consumer sale approach. And what you'll see here is that they were much less likely to scale than innovations that had another approach, which was to get an existing large entity to adopt, like a large business or a government. And you know, why is that? I think one clue is if you make, take a look at the next um, uh, uh, column, where you see the scaling rate by unit cost. And things that were inexpensive um, were much more likely to scale, you know, almost a 45% scaling rate compared to, uh, by scaling, I mean, reaching over a million people, compared to a very low scaling rate if they cost more than $3. If you're thinking about very inexpensive interventions, the customer acquisition costs are just huge uh, if you're trying to sell to individual consumers. So that makes it tough. And these were both, uh, both those two findings are significant. 
On population, we don't get a significant difference, but it does look a little bit easier to scale in a large country. We don't see any significant difference between for-profits and non-profits. We don't see any significant difference whether there's a local partner or not. Um, obviously, um, you know, I'm biased here as a development economist, but you know, there's often a view that academics or development re uh, or academics in general are sort of you know, ivory tower, they're not very good at real world things. Um, in fact, you know, we don't see, if anything, um, you know, the evidence suggests there was a considerably higher rate of scaling among pro projects that had an economics researcher involved, a development economics researcher. There was actually an incredibly high rate of scaling, and this must be to some extent just a sampling variation, among projects like the Javier Imana and Jack project where there was a previous RCT. You know, one hypothesis would be that the people uh, who come back and want to do another RCT on something where there's already been an RCT are very committed to seeing this um, affect the real world and, uh, because they've already written one article on it. Um, and so they're not motivated you know, only by, by trying to maximize expectations. There's a multivariable regression. Um, you know, a lot of the same things come out um, Perhaps not, not, not all as strongly. Populations now significant at the uh, 10%. Um, let me suggest a hypothesis <clears throat> that can Michael, maybe just both five, five more minutes if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, let me suggest a hypothesis that can explain both the um, high returns overall and the and the results on which types of innovation scaled. Um, and that would be that. I think one that comes very naturally to economists, which is that the private sector invests where, it's, where there are privately profitable innovation investments. And that leaves arbitrage opportunities for socially motivated investors in areas where there's low private returns, but high social returns. You know, what would those be? Well, you know, industrial organization theory gives us a sense of that. One is innovations with low barriers to entry. So if you're a private investor, and you're looking for firms to, you know, with an innovation, you would like it if it's very easy, if once that firm, if that firm succeeds, it's very hard for competitors to follow them. There's what uh, Warren Buffett calls a moat. Uh, you know, that could be intellectual property, it could be natural first mover advantage or scale economy, like might exist for Google or Facebook. Um, so those are, those are places where, or, for-profit investors would like high barriers to entry. A socially minded investor, they actually would like it if other firms, if once the, the, the initial firm um, has success, other, other competitors come in because that's better for consumer welfare and for, for scaling. Um, another area where there might be an arbitrage opportunity is if there's an innovation that requires a partner with proprietary complementary assets. So I showed you that most of the innovations that scaled were ones where it was not direct to consumers sales, where you had to get an existing large business or government to adopt. Now, if you think about the theory of innovations so of Scotchmer's work, for example, if you need a, if your innovation isn't gonna work without um, partnering up with someone else who has a proprietary complementary asset, they're gonna be able to get a bunch of the rents. You know, the insurance companies are not going to pay full value um, uh, for this uh, sticker technology, and nor is the government of Kenya. Um, so that makes it this less attractive to a commercial investor to develop this, uh, this technology. But that does leave an, 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 um, an arbitrage opportunity for an investor like Development Innovation Ventures. So what are the implications? I think this has implications not just for what you should invest in, but how social innovation funds should be organized. If you think about a lot of the characteristics that we had, things like external peer review or feedback for applicants, those are things that might not make sense for a private venture capitalist because other people might get the idea. And why would you spend time and effort giving feedback to the rejected applicants, especially when they might be the competitors with people you do fund? Um, we found a high return from early stage innovations. Now, many of these um, you know, could be copied by others or the early stage innovators might not actually get the rents from it. All of that is, is, um, is works for a social innovation funder, but might not work for a venture capitalist. 
even openness across sectors. You know, if you're a venture capitalist, unless you're a really top tier venture capitalist, you have to worry about adverse selection. If you fund the projects that come to you, you have to wonder, well, why did other people turn them down? One way to deal with that is to adopt a narrow focus where you really have a lot of expertise. Um, if you're a social funder, you don't face that type of competitive pressure and you may not need to do that. And obviously, um, you know, another market niche is innovations designed to scale the adoption by governments and existing large businesses. Here's, uh, let me skip over this uh, quickly, but you know, you can think of a chart like this where there are some things in the upper right um, that are things that are privately profitable and socially profitable and sort of straight for-profit private businesses will go into that business and, and do fine. But there may not be a lot of opportunities for, for um, social investment funds because those opportunities may already be taken. If you look at things that are privately profitable like alcohol or cigarettes, but socially harmful, you know, they're not gonna wanna go after that area. There are a bunch of things that are neither privately profitable nor socially great innovation investments like play pumps or one laptop per child. Um, those ones, um, you know, there's probably a lot of them out there, but you don't want to invest in those. I think the area that where there's an arbitrage opportunity is either things that are um, some of the things we invested in, uh, affordable glasses was one of them, uh, but rotavirus vaccine, pneumococcus vaccine are not things we were involved in. Those are things that might not have been profitable ex ante, but once the innovation costs were paid, you know, they can be sustained on a, on a, a, as a private business. The, the hope is the glasses will be and these other things. That would be, that's sort of what a, you know, an impact investor would be looking for. There's another area of things that will never be profitable, but might be socially valuable. Um, and you know, those, those might also be good investments for a social investor. Let me conclude. Um, you know, what are some takeaways? First, there's a very skewed distribution of innovation reach. That means you, know, you can't just go by anecdotes. You can't even go by counts. You really need a portfolio level analysis if you want to look at investment and innovation. And you know, I would argue that this approach, this bounding approach could be a useful one. Uh, when we applied it to the development innovation ventures portfolio, we see a huge excess of benefits to cost with just four, benefit, four projects having benefits that exceed the cost of the entire portfolio fivefold. Um, what were some of the key predictors of scale? Um, actually having a previous RCT or researcher involvement or uh, a strategy of tapping into pre-existing distribution networks. I think um, you know, it would be useful for other programs to try to track their, their reach and their impact and uh, their financing. And then that would enable similar analyses by other funders uh, that might be able to get at some of the questions of what's the rate of return to climate innovation, for example. Um, that's going to be a tough one, but uh, um, and I think I think we this approach could be used uh, much more broadly. Would love to take questions, and sorry for going a bit over. No, no, <clears throat> thank you so much, Michael. Really interesting presentation, of course. Um, can I ask people if you're interested in asking a question to use raise a hand, which is at the bottom of the participants tab, or if you're an attendee, just to flag that you're interested in the Q and A. And the first question we'll take is from Noreen. So I think Noreen, we're going to unmute you to ask your question. Yeah, I think. Hi there. Uh, yes, great. Um, thanks, Michael, for a really interesting presentation. And thanks, Simon, and the rest of the CSAE for hosting. This is fantastic to be able to attend. Um, so my question is, how were the four innovations chosen? So for example, were they the ones for which benefits were easier to measure, uh, including social benefits rather than just private benefits? Of course, you would have thought about this, but uh, the return on investment of those innovations may be very different from those for which benefit data are more difficult to measure. So I just wondered if you could speak to how this might influence your interpretation. Sure, yeah, so what we did, so, so let me start with the last point you made. So I think uh, exactly the type of analysis we wanted to avoid was, was one in which we, we selected four innovations which look good and we said we compared the benefits of those innovations to the cost of those innovations. If we had done that, um, we would have found you know, 
super positive results, but that would have been very misleading because as you saw, you know, the vast majority of innovations reached, you know, did not reach many people. And so focusing on just four and comparing the benefits of those four against the costs of those four would have been um, quite misleading. But we didn't do that. What we did instead was we said a lower bound under certain conditions, which I didn't go into in detail, but a lower bound on the total benefits of all 41 is the benefits of just those four. That's assuming that the others were not net negatives. And I think there's a, I think that's a justify, you know, I think that's a, a warranted assumption, but I could discuss that in more detail if you want. So we have a lower bound on the benefits of the, of the full portfolio. And then we set against that the cost of the full portfolio. So not just the cost of those four, but the cost of the full portfolio. So that will be a valid lower bound, uh, you know, again, under some, some fairly, uh, I think, justifiable assumptions on the benefit cost ratio for the full portfolio. Now, then the question is, how do you find those? Well, we, we, you actually do want to look for the things that were, that, that, um, that had, a, you know, had a chance of, uh, of having substantial benefits. So we looked at everything that went over a million users. There were nine of those. Of those nine, we could only we only had the data to quantify the benefits for four. So um, so I think that you know the benefits of some of these election technologies, for example, were likely very substantial. As would, um, but we we just haven't we conceptually we don't know how to value those. Um, so I think the overall benefit cost ratio is probably much much higher than the five to one lower bound that we we estimate. Um, okay. Let's see if it's okay. Uh, thank you very much, Noreen. Can we get a question from uh, Alessandro? And Alessandro, I think we'll unmute you, uh, and then you'll have a chance to ask that. Hi, Alessandro. Can you hear me now? I think we can hear you now. But let me, in that case, <clears throat> sorry, let me charge on and ask Alessandro's uh, uh, question. Um, the question from Alessandro Michael is, have you considered using economists with a history of success in scaling up rather than just economists uh, as a measure of success? That's, that'd be a great question, a great thing to look at. I'm not sure we'd be, you know, um, we'll see if we can look at it. Um, some of these people did have a, a track record, um, but um, so I don't know whether we have enough data to, you know, to discriminate in this study, but if more people did this, I think that could be assessed. Um, this is exactly the type of anecdote I was warning against, but you know, um, uh, there are some, some examples of people with a track record of scaling up. You know, there's a, a, a banner, you know, one of the, some of the uh, efforts on elections, that was a Banerjee and Pandy paper. Uh, but I don't know whether um, James Hadarimana and Billy Jack had a, had a um, had a track record of scaling prior to this, um, so um, nor do I know whether. And I, I do want to emphasize, you know, their initial efforts were not sponsored by the Kenyan government. Uh, they were not, um, you know, this was they they did not. This was their idea. It wasn't something that the insurance right. companies were implementing. This would not have met any of the classic uh, uh, criteria. Or if I think about the, I, I mentioned the election monitoring in Afghanistan. That was. Mike Cowan, who now has an amazing record of scaling things up, but, um, um, and, and James Long, I shouldn't uh, ignore uh, James Long. Uh, I saw Mike more recently, um, but, um, um, but, um, but I don't think they did at the time because they were just starting out at the time. So, um, um, so I personally think it makes sense to, um, to, to, to actually be quite broad and to, um, in, in funding and not to insist on that record. It might be a plus if you've got a record like that, but I, I think it would be a mistake to, uh, to uh, restrict funding to that group. Great. Um, let me apologize. We're gonna have one more question. I'll go to Kate Orkin. Let me apologize to everyone who's been trying to ask questions. We haven't managed to fit them in, I'm sorry. Thank you very much for your interest all the same. Kate, perhaps we could get your quick question and then we'll wrap up. So I just um, wondered about if you, you you used the DALI as a kind of common impact metric, which is really helpful from the health sciences perspective. It's obviously very difficult for economics to get to that kind of metric, but I wondered if you had considered other options. So the one I was thinking of was the kind of number needed to treat that they use in medicine. Um, so, you know, if you, if one, 
if this is our one desirable outcome, how many people do we need to treat with this intervention to, um, to get one person to say, get a job or recover from an illness or something. Um, but I wondered if you'd considered any other more universal metrics like food consumption or something like that. Where, where we could put, uh, uh, where we, so what we really wanted was things where we had dollars going in and dollars coming out where we could, you know, so if there was an agriculture project or something like that, uh, we could do that. And I think there was one kit, one where we actually did have dollar benefits. Um, um, but um, but you know, the other case that we looked at was health where we used dollars, but it would, I'm, I'm not actually, I'm actually not that familiar with the metric you're talking about. So maybe we can follow up off, offline and, and talk about that. Let me just say before um, before we end, I just wanted to say, you know, many of you who out there might uh, have innovations that you're interested in, and you know, this program remains open. Um, I put up the website if you are interested in applying. You know, I, I definitely encourage you to to visit the website, read the rules. Um, this is I mentioned the restrictive procurement rules. They're actually less restrictive now, but because it is government procurement, um, the staff there and I uh, and, and, and me, myself, um, you know, we can't give you advice on your odds of success with a particular idea and that sort of thing uh, in advance because that would violate the competition rules. But you know, the, um, the, the, with advice from the procurement people, it's now actually a quite simple sort of short five page concept note. And once that's submitted, if you get past that stage, then you can have um, uh, more conversations. So, encourage people to apply, you know, look, we are part, we're got part of the government. Governments aren't known for being fast. Uh, um, so, um, you know, this is not, you know, it'll take a while to turn around. You know, there's, there's always random factors with any funder and decisions. So, um, but I, you know, if you take a look at the website and if you think you're, you're raw, you've got an innovation that's relevant, please, uh, please do apply. Great. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for your time. Let me thank everyone for joining us uh, throughout this presentation and for your questions. And let me also ask you all just to keep your eyes on the CSAE Twitter account. We're managing these webinars on a just-in-time basis, but we're hoping to have another one about this speaker and a title. Thank you, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Stay safe. We'll see you again soon. Thank you.